Yeah, we're good. Okay, we are broadcasting. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am going to send a note in the chat box. Um, if someone would mind would not mind acknowledging that we're live because we can't really tell. Looks like we are. Um, uh, welcome everybody. We're gonna let the uh, uh, attendees populate the uh, Zoom call here. And while we're doing that, I'll do what most of you are probably aware of, uh, some housekeeping on Zoom. Please feel free to raise your hand in the Q&A, ask a question in the Q&A, ask a question in the chat window if you're on a computer. Um, I've actually not done this on the phone, so I don't know what the methodology is, but I think there's a, a way to ask questions on the phone. You're most welcome to do so. Um, I, I have to put a, uh, a big fat thank you to everybody during these last three months where we've been doing two or three or sometimes four webinars a week and uh, just really grateful for all your uh, participation at family members of Family Office Insights, you've been super great, and uh, we hope to continue to do this proactively. It's, uh, it's been re really a lot of fun for me, and we've been, uh, not only have we had a lot of good companies, uh, we've got lots in store as well. Uh, I'm gonna also send out a, a big, uh, loud thank you to my 15-year friend, Jerry Efrenides, who uh, brought this opportunity to us through his firm, Emergent and Wielden Company, and so that's how we know uh, Vino Ventures and their uh, 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 the colleagues of uh, of the firm here that you're going to be introduced to shortly. So again, thank you everybody for being here. If there's anybody that while you're watching this you'd like to invite last minute, we are welcome. That we've uh, kept the the registration open. We have about an hour together. Uh, we're going to do some short introductions here, and uh, then we're going to get into the presentation. And please uh, don't be bashful. Uh, go ahead and uh, ask questions uh, at will. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome our friends from Vino Ventures. And again, big thank you to Jerry and his colleagues. And Jacob, near David, I'm going to say that with my French-Israeli accent. Um, and uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur, and, and hello to everybody out there. And obviously, I uh, do also want to thank uh, Jerry and the Emergence team as well for connecting us to, to Arthur and, and, and his whole team. This is uh, definitely a real treat for us. So I'm going to take you through the presentation. Uh, not, you won't just be hearing from me, don't worry. You'll also be hearing from my partners, uh, Gil and Tim. But uh, it, as, as Arthur said, please ask uh, questions at any time. Uh, we're gonna try and monitor uh, the questions. We know the material well, you don't have to worry about throwing us off. So please uh, come, come with questions. Um, and we'll drill down on any aspect that you wanna drill down on. Um, so we're, we're gonna start this off. So again, we're, we're Vino Ventures. Um, we are a total return wine fund. And obviously, we're going to be talking about what that means. But we thought a lot about what that, what that means for us, which we'll explain to you. And also, innovation is very important to us as well. And as you learn more about uh, us as people and what we're doing, you'll understand why, why innovation is so important to us. Um, you'll meet the team, or at least some of the team. And you have to get a sense of the decades of experience of the team both in the fine wine trading world, in winery world, from, from the inside, from the outside, uh, and technology and business and finance. All of that led us to uh, our very unique strategy, uh, which we will go into a bit more detail later on, uh, which all together combine for us targeting what we call uncorrelated, uncorrelated to the, to the standard markets, total return of 20% of and, and hopefully more a year. So that's Vino Ventures. That's why we think you should be investing in Vino Ventures. The rest uh, of tonight is gonna be the commentary to that. 
uh, but we're super excited and, and very happy that you're here with us. Uh, so now just a, a step back to tell you a little bit more about us and, and, and who we are. So first of all, I'm, I'm Jacob Nair David. Uh, you can say it with whatever accent you want, it's okay. Most people mess up my name. Um, so first and foremost, I'm sitting in my own winery right now. It's not a virtual background. That's the tasting room of my winery, which I started eight years ago after uh, almost a lifelong, lifelong passion for uh, wine. And I actually have a glass of wine with me, which I will drink towards the end of the, <laughs> of the presentation. And by building up this winery and exporting around the world, really learn the, the insights of the wine industry. Uh, along the way, in a parallel life that I have in tech startups and the business world, during a stint that uh, I had at McKinsey, I met uh, Gil Pukowski. Um, you can just raise your hand, say hello, Gil. Uh, I met Gil Pukowski, and together a couple of years ago, we founded a company called Vincent, which is a marketplace for uh, boutique wineries around the world to sell direct to consumer. Um, and through that, uh, we met Tim, uh, who is our, our third partner joining us for the presentation today. And Tim, uh, over the past 10 years, after a career in finance, uh, over the past uh, 10 years has been running a wine investment business, a wine distribution business, and a logistics business in, in the wine space. Um, and just he became the ideal partner for us in, in so many different ways. And as we were developing the concept of Pinot Ventures, we shared with him the thoughts and uh, we were lucky enough that he agreed to join us in, uh, in our journey of Vino Ventures. Uh, some other team members who you will not hear from tonight, uh, but who are very much involved with what we're doing. We have Colin Gent, uh, who is uh, one of the very limited number of masters of wine in the world. Uh, who has a 30-year experience in the fine wine world on all sides of it. Um, he is based in Bordeaux. Uh, alongside Colin, we have Gerard, Gerard uh, Spadafora, who is also based in Bordeaux. He is a wine e-commerce expert, uh, spent uh, quite some time building up the online business of uh, Milissima, one of the largest negociants uh, out of Bordeaux, and has uh, developed into a real global authority uh, in the world on how to sell fine wine online. So just a little bit about the wine market, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, but sometimes we, we don't even realize how big the wine world really is. Um, you know, my own winery is a very small part of that, but uh, the, the, the wine world as a whole generates over $300 billion a year of top line revenue. The investment grade wine market, uh, which is what we would call fine wines that really have name brands and that are very easily uh, defined in terms of their market value, are at least $10 billion a year turnover of that. The wine market as, as a whole continues to grow at a, a quite a, a good pace. Um, as you might expect, Europe is the largest exporter of wine and the U.S the largest consumer of wine, uh, and also the largest consumer of, ex of imported wine. Um, to give you a slightly different view of that, we have uh, France, Italy, Spain as the largest exporters uh, of wine. And then the US, uh, even though the US has a quite a nice uh, local wine industry, uh, which generates California wine, uh, wine industry itself generates uh, over $70 billion a year, the, the U.S. as an exporter uh, is, is, is quite low there in terms of uh, size of export uh, of their wines. So mainly importing from places like France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and so on. Um, and that's important to remember as we get into our investment strategy and how we look at the world. So just to kind of give you some comfort in terms of investing in wine, because a lot of people don't have experience uh, investing in wine. And they say, you know, what does that mean? Am I, you know, literally uh, gonna be, am I, am I drinking my, my investment? Like, what does it mean to invest in wine? So 
When we started uh, working on Vino Ventures, we drafted a memo, it's about uh, now, about five, six months ago, in, in uh, six months ago in December of 2019. And we wrote up this memo looking backwards saying wine uh, produces attractive risk adjusted returns. That if you look back over time, wine retains its value as defensive capital preservation characteristics. And we said this back in, in December, having no idea what was, what was coming. And sure enough, over the past five, six months, even when lots of other, uh, lots of other indices dropped uh, by tens of percent, uh, wine essentially uh, held its value. Again, I'm talking about the, the relatively high end of wine, fine wine, uh, held its value. And if you look back over time, this is giving you a view from 2004 uh, essentially to the, to the present day, you'll see the green line, uh, which is uh, this index of fine wines, uh, continues straight up, very little downs, uh, while the rest of the markets go up and down, up and down, uh, kind of roller coaster as we've all experienced over the years. So it's important to keep in mind that wine has performed exceedingly well uh, in absolute terms, as well as defensively uh, over the past 20, 30 years. So it's, that is important to keep in mind as we look at the, our specific strategies uh, within, within the world, wine world. And now I'm gonna hand the mic over to Tim, who's gonna take us through the inefficiencies of the wine world. Great, Jacob, thank you. Um, so yes, one of the characteristics of the wine market is even though it's an extremely large market, relatively speaking, um, it is uh, quite inefficient. And that inefficiency actually leads to uh, pricing differentials from market to market. Um, so, I mean, you can, I won't read the, uh, the various bullet points to you, but one of the characteristics of the market, and I think this is particularly true for fine wine, is that the pricing that you'll find for the same wine from, say, any of the European markets to the U.S. market can be as much as two or in some time, in, in some cases, two and a half times uh, different. So the U.S. market tends to price wines much more expensively than the European market does. And actually, very little of that difference can be attributed to transportation. What it really comes down to is that the U.S. market has a much more extended supply chain. So as an example, the typical bottle of fine wine that sits on a, um, a, a, fine, a wine shop uh, shelf has probably transited through at least five hands before it got to the end consumer. That is not the case in the European markets. And basically, with the transiting through all of those different hands, there's margins that are attached to that. Um, one of the things that we, um, one of the theses behind the fund, and it's something that we've actually been doing for a number of years, is to take advantage of those price differentials and effectively arbitrage those differences from the European markets to the US markets. Um, in order to do that, you do require quite a bit of understanding. You need to know what to buy. You need to know where to buy it, what prices to buy it. You need to have a way to get rid of that wine, in other words, to sell that wine in your destination markets. And you really do need to have a logistics understanding to be able to move those wines across um, you know, the Atlantic efficiently and frankly, rapidly. In addition, I just want to point out uh, something that Tim has, uh, has accomplished, uh, which is figuring out all the different licenses one needs to actually do this business in a, in a legal and proper way. Uh, we will not take you through the 50 different states and, and, all, of their, <laughs> and all of their nuances, but um, the global wine market itself is, is, is a complicated one. Once you get to the US market, uh, you not only need a deep understanding, as Tim said, but, but you actually literally need to have uh, a whole variety of different licenses to, to do what you want to do. Um, and uh, Gil is now going to talk about our investment strategy and uh, how we plan on deploying uh, the money that we're going to put to work. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Uh, so as we explained, we've uh, seen these inefficiencies in the, in the wine world. Uh, 
and what we have decided to deplore at core as a strategy is a short term uh, trading strategy where we see geographic arbitrage opportunities uh, for high end wine, high end wines. Uh, this is the core of our strategy, obviously, uh, and the times are also showing that there are some opportunities that we can see in trade finance, where what we see is that different parties along the value chains that have the wine at specific moment in time uh, have a specific uh, uh, demand in, uh, in cash flows. And this is where we see also opportunistic uh, uh, ways to invest, uh, taking wine with the understanding that we have as a collateral to the money that we would be, be loaning these uh, parties. So in terms of uh, capital deployment and expected return, as we said, the core of our strategy is short term. Uh, we feel confident from past experience that we could deploy uh, the first five millions of our fund in a period of three months. What we see as average size of each position is around $10,000. And when we speak of short term, the cycle that we see in between buy to sell, be it for any different uh, uh, sell that we, we and avenues that we'll be describing later on, be there B2B or B2C, we see this period of time of about four to five months. Uh, as a consequence of that, we see uh, a yearly capital turnover of two to two and a half times, and uh, an average net return per cycle per those cycle of four to five months of 10 to 15%, which gives us an annualized target return of 20% plus. Please, uh, we're not gonna uh, spend so much time uh, on these, but we did wanna give you a sense of both the breadth and the depth of what does it mean to operate a trading business like this. These are uh, real trades uh, that were done from different regions, as you'll see, Italy, France, uh, within France, uh, Bordeaux, uh, Burgundy, and uh, their, their, their buy side prices, uh, where they were purchased, and then all the different ways that they were sold, um, and the different uh, numbers of transactions. When you kind of scan over your eyes over to the right-hand side, the most important thing, I think, is the net return on, uh, on all of that. And you'll see the net return, as uh, Gil described, falls within the ranges that we're talking about, obviously some higher uh, as well. So just to give you a sense of the type of trading that we're talking about doing, obviously anybody who wants to ask any you know, more detailed questions about this uh, trading strategy, which Gil said is about uh, ninety percent of of what our focus uh, is. Please, you know, ask away. We we live this day to day, so <laughs> we, it's difficult for us to to guess your questions. But please uh, ask questions. Um, and uh, now let me just talk about uh, our advantages and, and how is it that we that we do all of this magic. Uh, so, first of all, we have unique sourcing, both on um, the side of relationships that this entire team and, and all the, beyond the team itself, all the team's connections, who have built in terms of wineries, traders, uh, distributors, uh, buyers in, in the most important wine regions of the world. Um, and that couple- Jacob, I, I don't know if you see the questions, maybe, uh, maybe just some, something to address, somebody is asking, uh, what, how do we handle the transportation with focus on quality control and temperatures levels? So sure. Tim, maybe you want to, uh, to give a, a word about that. Sure. I think um, if I am not missing it, it seemed like there were two questions. One is about COVID, yeah. how COVID might so have changed. So you do see them. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, you know, very quickly, um, in the U.S. market, what COVID has done is effectively 
uh, created a rush to the known. In other words, what you've seen is that the kind of classic wine regions, the, the, the best known wineries are the ones that have benefited the most, the ones that are kind of more obscure. Um, so just to take an example, uh, folks who are dealing with an entirely natural wine portfolio have had a much harder time. Um, and that's really a consequence of people not being able to walk into a wine store. And so what do they go with? They go with what they know. It's harder to hand sell when you can't talk to people. Um, in terms of the transportation, uh, these wines are transported in temperature controlled containers, uh, ocean freight uh, primarily. Every now and then we'll do an air freight. Uh, ocean freight, what we found is that, and this is with, this is with having uh, importing an average of about 150,000 cases a year into the United States. Uh, what we have found is the temperature controlled ocean freight, you get almost no issues with uh, temperature or quality control uh, when the wine is on water. The most dangerous parts, frankly, are on land. Um, it's getting it from the port to the warehouse. That is where you tend to get the biggest issues. That said, um, I would estimate that uh, we have an issue with perhaps a quarter of 1% of all of the wines that are brought over, if not, if, if even that. Um, and then I'd also add that um, in addition to, you know, just taking care to transport it in the right ways, temperature control it, uh, all of the wine as it's being transported is, uh, is insured and is insured basically with a marine and in one policy um, that is underwritten by Chubb. So it's been in place for, for uh, over 10 years. We've um, on rare occasions have had to uh, use it, uh, but I can, in 10 years of doing this, we've had to probably go to our insurance policy three times total. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and, uh, and keep the questions coming. Um, hold on, now, I just, now I'm actually seeing some of the questions. Uh, yeah. What impact yeah, does the collapse of the on-premise market have on the fund and anticipated returns? So, uh, you know, it's an excellent uh, question. Um, first of all, uh, what uh, I'm just going to go back to this for a second. First of all, I just wanted to, you know, answer a little bit from my uh, personal experience, and uh, and then uh, you know Tim will definitely chime in as well. As a, as a winery owner, we went into uh, I went into COVID not knowing at all what was going to happen and assuming the worst. Uh, what actually uh, happened in reality is that we sold more wine over the past uh, three months than we were expecting to sell. So uh, obviously we're all very sad, and, and I mean that in a, in a real way. Uh, I've, I've lost friends to, to COVID, I've had friends who were hospitalized. But we saw the people who uh, were sheltering at home and thank God were healthy, uh, they, as Tim said, turned to what they know and they turned actually to quality. Uh, so they were learning how to order wine online and they were ordering good wine uh, because you know if you're going to be sitting at home you want to drink good wine <laughs> if you can um, and so we, we saw that directly as a as a winery um, so we actually sold more wine in this period than we expected to sell uh, through all the channels that we usually would have had in place um, and i know tim you you've seen some similar some similar trends, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and Jacob, one thing I would ask, if we could go back one, uh, just one slide into the indicative past trades. Um, you know, I think to answer the question, you know, maybe perhaps a slightly different way, if you look at the kind of, the, one of those middle columns, I think it says cumulated number of bottles per channel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I won't go through reading all of that, but I think the important takeaway from that is that uh, we don't have uh, one route to market. We try to create as many routes to market as is possible. And so that is on-premise. That would be traditional wine retail off-premise. That would be internet retail, uh, which was already a pretty, for the fine wine side of things, was already a reasonably sizable proportion of what was happening in the market and has certainly grown since then. Um, we sell via special relationships with auction houses. And that's for a specific kind of, a specific sets of wines because auction can be an inefficient way to do it for uh, for frankly a large number of wines. Um, we also have private client networks. Uh, we sell on to other wholesalers. So the idea here is that the more channels of distribution you've got, 
the more ways you can sell the wine to, uh, you know, sell the wine that you've got, uh, the more you are insulated from any one of these markets really having a big downturn. Clearly, on-premise has had a very, very tough time in the last three or four months. Um, but I think, as Jacob said, one of the things that we've seen is that there has been an upturn in the number of bottles sold to traditional wine retailers, and certainly a very large upturn in terms of the number of wine, uh, number of bottles sold to internet retail, and then directly to private clients. In addition, one of the things you know, one of the the things that we've um, we've noticed quite recently is that. Some of the wines that we have um, that we've sold via auction channels, those auction channels are actually getting quite a bit more action than in a tradition, you know, than they traditionally would. So we've seen the total number of bids per lot, or the average number of bids per lot, uh, go up dramatically. And ironically, we've even seen prices paid for the wines, um, for the same wines, go up versus, say, the end of 2019. Um, when there was a relatively robust market. So, um, you know, so again, I think I go back to the same thing. I, I certainly echo everything that Jacob said and would add that I think one of the ways to protect against this is to have a multiplicity of, um, of distribution outlets. Exactly. And, um, sorry. Um, yeah, keep the questions coming. Um, so hold on, was there another question coming in? Uh, cover uh, front. Uh, yes, we definitely yeah, will. We will. We do continue. Oh, we're we'll getting to that very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Just to uh, to tease you a little bit more, uh, in terms of, of the Vino Ventures advantages, um, and and please pardon uh, the the somewhat intended puns, you know, of liquidity and so on. It's hard to avoid it in the in the wine business, in general. So, as I was talking about, on the on, on one hand, we've got direct access. Uh, around the world. On the other hand, we have in place the benefit of all the logistics and regulatory setup necessary to uh, take this uh, fund and start trading in the name of the fund tomorrow morning. Um, both in, in terms, terms of, of roots. Yeah, both in terms of B2B uh, as well as B2C. So we have a proprietary uh, direct consumer marketplace that I mentioned that Gil and I had uh, have set up, which is up and running and selling. Uh, you can go check it out. Uh, there's some good wines and good deals on there. If I put my my salesperson hat on, um, where we've uh, shipped wine together with with uh, Tim and our other partners have shipped wine to over 12 countries already. Um, so that it will is and will will remain uh, and only only the more so. Another important channel for us going forward is, is Vino Ventures. Um, finally, can, I, can I just uh, interrupt real quick and on that last slide and ask a question, guys? Uh, the uh, is it is it fair to say that the idea of having a fund is to just what traditionally is the idea of having a fund, and that is to leverage a skill set that you have with. Uh, uh, money that that can exponentially grow the trades as opposed to in the case of um, all the things you have in place clearly you could just be a broker and make plenty of money um, but maybe not enough so I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about is the uh, be, taking possession and paying for the wine gives you leverage whereas just being a broker is being at risk I'm making that statement up but I'm thinking <laughs> what other people might be thinking. Uh, yeah, you're, you've been, you've, you're, you're a good business person. You're a good read. You do this a lot. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, no, we did not uh, cook up that, that question by Arthur beforehand. Uh, so thank you for the spontaneity as well. Um, but yes, you, you've kind of captured an important thing. You know, having uh, control uh, over how the wine moves and where the wine moves is extremely important because if you are, if you remain hostage to the way things are, uh, then the, the profit potential goes dramatically down. If you take control over it, your profit potential goes uh, to, to, to the degree that we, that we mentioned. Um, so yeah, the, the, the idea of a fund is to be masters of our destiny and scale up what we've, uh, what we've already been doing. 
the, the other thing, Jacob, the other thing that I would just add to that very quickly is, um, is you know, a lot of the folks who are brokers. So if you look at the fine line brokerage business, a lot of those people, their, their core business is really supplying restaurants with fine wine um, because restaurants have a constant need to, to have more fine wine on their, on their wine lists and continuously replenish. Um, obviously, that's a pretty difficult market for them to be operating in right now um, because that market just died. So I think one of the other things to say is by controlling this and having access to all these different channels of distribution, um, you've again created a much higher potential for return. Um, finally, I just want to touch uh, uh, very briefly on technology. I am a technology entrepreneur by, uh, by my, uh, by my career, outside wine career. Um, and Gil and I did, have worked on technology issues. And one of the things that um, we realized as we started going down the path together with Tim is how much technology could uh, create even more efficiency out of these inefficient uh, markets, particularly around creating uh, structured data. And I don't want to put people to sleep uh, with a discussion about creating structured data from unstructured data, but um, the wine world is a very conventional world. There are people literally still using, uh, uh, I mean, fax machines would be, would be technology for them already. They're, they're still <laughs> using pen and paper. Uh, and that is how bids and, and, and offers and sales are taking place. So by uh, creating a structure out of a lot of unstructured data, we can hone in on uh, what we see as the kind of cherry picking from a trading point of view, and on the uh, sell side, be able to optimize everything for the right distribution channels that, that Tim was talking about before. Finally, uh, you only add to the value when you can attest to the uh, authenticity. And because we are not simply brokers, because we're taking uh, control over the wine, we know exactly where it's coming from. We follow it every step along the way, so we can attest to the provenance and the authenticity uh, of, of the wine. And we have been spending quite a bit of time uh, working on best of breed solutions for uh, bottle by bottle uh, authenticity solutions which are quite important. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, fraud in the, in the fine wine world. Um, so we got another set of questions appearing in another channel of Q&A. Uh, somebody, Anthony, is asking uh, about the margins and about the spread of what we pay versus sell. So Anthony, I think that in the table where we show the three examples, uh, we see the gross return and then the net return and in between is basically, uh, uh, I mean, the gross return, you could, you could uh, refer it to what we pay in between what, what we, uh, in, uh, of what we sell, uh, on, on the return we pay what we sell. You're asking also regarding the currency volatility, is it an issue? I think that uh, one of the um, reasons uh, that we've seen in addressing a short-term type of strategy is that uh, uh, at the difference of the classic buy and hold strategies that you would see in other wine funds, uh, we can control in a, in a more uh, diligent manner the, uh, the currency volatility. Uh, you ask regarding cross-border buy and then sell. Is, is cross-border buy and then sell an issue? Um, and the last question you ask is if demand short term slows uh i don't completely understand what so, you're um, so, but, uh, so gil maybe uh maybe i can jump in on on sure. the um so in in terms of just elaborating on what gil said in terms of currency volatility um one of the things about the wine business is that uh, prices tend to react slowly um so when you have currency volatility um, generally speaking, you, if you're going in for a short-term trade the way we are, where you're talking about the entire cycle being a four to five month period, uh, currency volatility is not going to be an issue that's going to materially impact uh, returns. It may have a small impact, but given that the currency pairs that you're really talking about here are dollar pound or dollar euro, those tend to be relatively stable. 
other than if Britain decides to exit again, exit the EU again, which hopefully they've only done once. So they can't do it again. In terms of cross-border buying and selling, uh, that's not an issue at all. Uh, that requires an understanding of logistics. It requires a set of, you know, an understanding of the regulatory regimes, um, which is something that we do understand. Um, and frankly, it is the cross-border buying and then selling is the opportunity uh, to trade. It's it's taking advantage of price differentials across different geographic markets uh, that is what generates this return. Um, if demand slows in the short term, can you pass time and store until demand slash prices recover? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we also have here is uh, a series of warehouses that are climate controlled. And in those warehouses, you can store wine for, for as long as or as short as need be. Um, in a traditional, in the, the context of this fund, if we were to um, just go through the, the base strategy, the warehouse would be used primarily for transiting and for kind of unloading and loading back up to send the wine out to the various final points of consumption or final points of sale. Um, but equally, it's a warehouse. You can store wine and we do store wine. We store, uh, we store tens of thousands of cases of wine uh, in, those, uh, in those warehouses. And as I said, they're climate controlled, uh, they're alarmed, they have backup generators, all of that. I do want to make sure we don't, uh, that we have time to get to get through the, 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 uh, the, the, what some people have been waiting for, but I see there are more questions coming in. So we'll just, uh, I do want to give respect to those questions and then we'll, I'll, I'll move us along a bit more. Um, so Rob asks, is the fund structured with side pocket flexibility for equity or lending for positions into selected vineyards? So the main uh, focus right now, Rob, is to only be in situations where we have ownership of wine or wine is collateral, where it's sitting in a bonded facility uh, and we have access to it. So outside of the, those situations, we're not uh, looking to deploy capital right now. Uh, in the future, as we move along, if, uh, if we see such incredible opportunity where we can get uh, returns similar to the returns that we're talking about from our strategies, we will, we will definitely contemplate it. Um, uh, John asks, what about the impact of political volatility, scenarios, uh, tariffs, um, uh, China. So uh, I can only say that we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> but uh, I can say that um, you know the mar the market is the, the wine market is a market, and, and Tim, I think you can even speak even more intelligently than I could into this. But sure. um, you know, markets build 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 into their prices, uh, build into their prices, uh, things like tariffs moving either way. Um, and, and China, I don't think anybody could figure out China, but, but <laughs> Tim, what would your answer on tariffs be? Yeah, so look, I think we had a very real life experience with tariffs in, um, in October, where the tariffs on certain European wines was raised, um, was raised 25%. So it was really, it applied to French wines of uh, alcohol levels under 14%, which is the majority of French wines. Um, the uh, what you there are a couple of ways that I think you mitigate those tariffs. Number one, those tariffs eventually will be uh, will be imputed into the cost of the wine. They have to be right. So as more and more flows come into the U.S. from France, uh, the cost of those wines, the cost of the tariffs is going to is going to get included in the final selling price. So prices for those wines will rise. In the short term, however, um, we have on staff somebody who is a licensed customs broker and. That is, it sounds like nothing, uh, but that's a test that something like a half to 1% of the people who take it every year pass. So it's actually a pretty serious credential for this. As part of that, a large part of it is understanding exactly what the impact of tariff, is, is understanding what the tariffs apply to and where there are ways to um, minimize or mitigate the, the impact of tariffs. And so one of the things that we were able to do was find ways that are completely legal within the US code to minimize the impact of tariffs. And a lot of that just has to do with how uh, the way the US code treats supply chains. So if you understand those, and this sounds like a very, very, uh, this sounds like a very prosaic answer for, you know, for a, a, an industry that's driven by passion, the wine industry, 
um, but it's applying nothing a whole lot more, uh, nothing very different than what, say, the large car companies do when they produce at the U.S.-Mexico border and the average car goes across the border 12 times. Um, it's, it's very similar to doing that. And, and if you understand those things, you can, impact, you can mitigate the impact of tariffs to the extent that instead of the 25% tariffs that um, were announced, instead of paying the 25% tariffs that were announced, we were in a fully legal way uh, able to reduce those to something closer to four or five percent. Um, there was one other question that I don't know if it got answered or not, and it was about the cost of, it, it I think fundamentally had to do with the cost of holding. If prices, if things slowed down and you had to hold and warehouse, um, how would that impact returns? Um, Storing in a warehouse is a pretty inexpensive endeavor. So the total cost of storing in the average warehouse is something like 50 or 60 cents per case per month. When you're talking about wines that we would be, you know, we would, we would estimate we would be talking about an average of $1,000 case um, wine, holding for three months is not going to materially impact your, um, your returns, just because it's going to be about a buck 50 to $2 uh, on $1,000. So. Um, and then I, I think also just want to back up what we were saying before, is that even during the past few months, which, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a global uh, pandemic, we did not see a slowdown in the, uh, in the buy, in, in, in terms of people uh, looking to buy the wines we're talking about. Uh, in terms of the sales to Chinese collectors, is that an important market? It is an important market, but it's not an important market for us right now. Um, we're not focused on that route. Um, over time, uh, we certainly could be, but uh, not not in the very near future. Uh, simply because uh, we see enough opportunity in, in the markets that we already know. Uh, John asks, "Do you think U.S. tax rates on high-income individuals have an impact?" Um, I want to hold that uh, if we can end till till the end. Uh, well, we're not we're not ignoring it. We'll come back to it. I just wanted to kind of get us through uh, a little bit more. Of, uh, of, of the presentation, um, just so you have the, the full picture and then we'll come back to the question. Um, and I'm not, I'm seeing the chats now, but I'm still not seeing the other ones. So uh, definitely stop me. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, cool. you're, you're good, we got you covered. Keep on moving. Thank you, Robert. In terms of competitive landscape, just a lot of you may be familiar with wine funds that are out there. Uh, for example, uh, there are a lot of buy and hold type funds, which Tim referred to. Uh, so those buy and hold funds over time, has, some of them have done well. If they, if they knew what they were buying, uh, they, they've done, they bought right, they, they've done well. Uh, the, the problems that we see in, in those strategies uh, that we personally have encountered and, and a lot of fr our friends have encountered are uh, there's very little liquidity in terms of the portfolio itself. You have high subscription fees, uh, you have issues of redemption, uh, and none of those wine funds trade on U.S. exchanges. So your only hope is to wait to the end of the period of the fund to see whether you really made, uh, made money or not. Um, we are much more interested, uh, as Gil talked about, in these short cycles, uh, turning our capital around quickly and not being exposed uh, to a lot of uh, risk that we see in, in, in this strategy. Um, Finally, in terms of key terms, uh, Gil's going to take you through the key terms of the fund. Yeah, so in terms of uh, minimum investment, uh, we speak of a minimum ticket of uh, $250,000. Uh, somebody was asking about, uh, about the terms, so we've decided for the first for the initial $10 million investment, we decided not to take any management fee, but to be compensated only on performance. So the GP would get compensated only on performance uh, by 30% of the performances. turn as uh, Jacob mentioned one of our purposes is uh, by the strategy to have uh, uh, liquidity uh, at uh, the level of the portfolio but we also 
wish to have a liquidity at the level of the structure of its fund itself. So we're giving the option uh, for the holding of, uh, of um, the fund in the form of digit, in, in digital form, uh, which will uh, give access to, to a secondary market as we, we want to have the Vino Venture trading on the T0 exchange, uh, which is a, a platform with whom we have a long-term and uh, in bricked relationship for quite, quite some time already. Yeah. So I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna take up too much of our time now on T0 or the digital security landscape, uh, but it is an emerging alternative trading system fully regulated by the SEC. Uh, more and more activity uh, literally every day. Um, our relationship with them is that uh, we have a very close relationship with Medici Ventures who gave back the T0 and we know the people quite well and uh, they're, they're eagerly awaiting us uh, to, to come on their uh, platform when we're, when we're ready. Um, finally, because uh, wine is fun, uh, is fun rather, <laughs> because mm -hmm. Not only about uh, about uh, about making money, but it's primarily about making money. But it's about wine. So we also want you to enjoy uh, the, the, your your your, uh, your return beyond the, the money itself. So for people who are wine people, or want to want to kind of include their their friends and family who are wine people, uh, so all the things that you would expect to get by being part of a family like this. So uh, preferential access in terms of uh, buying wine co-investment opportunities that might come along, uh, obviously entry into chateaus uh, in various winemaking regions, which we have relationships with. Uh, and then uh, we will be uh, generating exclusive content for our uh, fund members as well, of course, the analysis of, uh, the, of the wine industry. And um, now I wanna go back to John's uh, question. It's about U.S. tax rates and, and high-income individuals have an, have an impact. Um, that's above my pay grade, so I don't know if anybody wants to take a stab at that. I am a U.S. taxpayer, but uh, uh, I don't I don't know. Uh, um, you know, I, I can answer just sort of in um, I can answer in terms of the recent experience we had with the 2017 um, tax uh, the tax overhaul. Um, what I would say is they did not see much of an impact at all in terms of fine wine prices or, um, or uh, frankly, any elements of it. Demand tended to remain about the same. Uh, prices didn't really move materially um, outside of the kind of direction they were already going in. So um, it may have more of an impact at the absolute tippy top of the market where you're talking about bottles that are selling for $1,000 a bottle and more. But for the average fine wine side, uh, and I would say the average fine the average fine wine bottle being say something between one hundred and two hundred dollars a bottle, um, we didn't see much of a uh, much of a change in, in any of the elements of this. Um, so somebody is asking if we'll have the deck uh, available. Sure, you can uh, definitely send us an email, and uh, and we'll be happy to. Uh, to send you the deck, unless Arthur, you have a better way to share it. Uh, um, no, I just have still a use way, emails. I have a way of getting me out of the way, um, <laughs> the, uh, which is also self-serving. Um, so uh, I will be sending along all the email addresses and names of people who officially registered, and whoever did that would would get. Uh, you can send whatever you want to them, and they'll welcome it, I'm sure. So that's the answer to your question, John. Um, and we'll uh, make sure that uh, we put you in direct in touch with the folks here, which is our pleasure. And that's the intent. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank everybody for all of your questions and your interest and for showing up today. Um, and if you have any additional questions, please uh, reach out. Uh, to us, either through Arthur or, or directly to any of us. Um, we're, we're pretty responsive uh, folks. And uh, we hope to have you along with us as we, we go down this exciting, uh, this exciting path. So uh, cheers to everyone.
yeah. got my wine. Where, where, I, where I am, it's, uh, it's, it's already, uh, it's okay to be drinking wine already. So. It's okay to be drinking wine for breakfast. My grandmother used to have <laughs> coffee. Uh, the, uh, I have a couple, if it's okay with you, sort of closing yeah, questions that others may be thinking about. Uh, it, uh, how, how, how far along and how long have you uh, been opening this up to, to the raise? And, and have you have you raised any money? Is it is it uh, at the onset of, of doing this? Uh, just some sort of metrics around uh, where you are in the process. Yeah. So uh, kind of COVID did uh, slow us down a bit, like uh, many of us at first. Um, but then we realized, you know, that the, the world hasn't come to an end, and then we should move forward. So. We have been uh, talking with folks, uh, literally, I would say, just over the past couple of weeks to start it. And this is our first formal, formal presentation. So once again, thank you to Arthur and the emergence team for, for putting this together. This is our, our first group uh, presentation. Um, so we have, we have gotten this uh, out there to some, some close, closer friends, uh, collecting indications of interest. Uh, we have not filled up to 10 million yet, so there's room for people to still uh, get in as part of that. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty much at the at the onset, but uh, already seeing a lot of uh, strong interest. Have you got a sense of what the, and I mean this in the most affectionate way, the friction will be associated with any co-investment? Uh, friction will be in terms of which? Co-investment. So, so somebody puts, somebody puts a million bucks in the fund and says, "Okay, I like that trade. I want to put a million dollars into that trade." Are you going to do? Uh, uh, I'm not suggesting you do this. I'm just co-investment was term was used earlier, so I'm not defining it for you. But if somebody wanted to pile on some more money other than into the fund and help a trade along, if need be. Is there, is there a delta between the management fee and the performance fee for a co-investment? Right, so there's no, I mean, there's no management fee at all right now, it's yeah. just a performance fee. Uh, it's mainly because we really believe in what we're doing. So we, yeah. we're, we're happy to, to have all of our skin in the game and, and, and focus on performance. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, co-investment rights, we're, we're figuring that out. Uh, as, uh, as we mentioned, these are, uh, this is a series of many, 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 many trades. Uh, average lot, as, uh, as Gil mentioned, is, is relatively low. Uh, so there, there will be opportunities for people to uh, co-invest where we see opportunities which we're not gonna take, we're not gonna take all available uh, supply for the fund, but but offer it out to, to other other people, to, to people in the fund. Um, I don't think we're gonna be entertaining sort of, you know, a million in the fund and then a million, yeah. you know, to, to co-invest because that would be just managing the other million as well. <laughs> yeah, right, no, no. Well, you, if you're gonna manage the other millions, you get paid for that too, but it's totally cool. I was just thinking, and I wouldn't take my recommendation, but I'm gonna make one. I think you should do, do a co-invest to drink. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that, but yeah, no, I do. You know, I think as people get involved in something like this, they get exposed to what uh, Tim was taking us through earlier of how inefficient, meaning how much people pay for the product that they love, and then they realize they could be buying it for half the price, or sometimes even uh, literally two thirds less than than what they've been paying without doing that much calisthenics of like this, we can, uh, we can help them, we can help them uh, get, get that wine. So for people who want to get really quality wine and fine wine and they want to be able to drink it, but want to be able to do that by save, saving, you know, 50%, uh, we, we can definitely help them that with that as well. That's what I had in mind. Very self-serving. <laughs> Thank you for that. Sure, Is, sure. Any, uh, closing remarks you'd like to make and any uh, questions you guys uh, um, in the Family Office Insights family out there would like to uh, 
pose before we uh, wrap things up here? I mean, the only thing I, I want to drive home kind of once again is uh, what we started off with when we were presenting the fund's thesis, which is essentially wine retains its value, uh, number one, and number two, how inefficient the market currently is. And that's something that I discovered as a winery owner building my sales around the world. It's something that Tim discovered as a as he became a, a wine trader over the years um, and, and focused in on the logistical side. Uh, Gil knows it from the financial side. It's just an extremely inefficient world. And it's a product that everyone loves uh, for good reason. People are prepared to pay quite a bit of money for quality. And we think there's a lot of opportunity for us to deliver for, you know, for good or for bad, uh, for quite some time, there'll be a lot of opportunity in, in, in the wine world. It doesn't, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't modernize very quickly. Very, very cool. Well, nicely done, guys. Thank you for being here. And thank you again to uh, Jerry and our friends over at Emergent and Wilden Company. And you guys did a great job. And I, I don't have to say that, but you did. Um, so really, really appreciate it. And we'll make sure you're in touch with everybody who registered and attended and uh, um, look forward to hearing how you progress very much so. Sure. Okay. Right. Cheers, everyone. Right. Cheers. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you, Arthur. Okay, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.